Welcome to the show. It's great to be with you. Um, what a time to be running for president. <laughs> The Hunger Games, yes. what is it at this yes, point? Yes, it feels like that. There, are, there were 24, 25, I think five dropped out, so we're still at too many. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you are still confidently running in this race with a platform that many have said is different to what you see yeah. from the other candidates. What do you think separates you? Yeah, I think I am the only one in this field that actually won a Trump state. Donald Trump took Montana by 20. I was reelected by four. 25 to 30 percent of my voters actually voted for Donald Trump. And that's also being at the core of the word pro progressive is really making progress, but it will make meaningful progress in everything from education to protecting civil liberties to protecting a woman's right to make her own health care decisions to really move and kicking dark money out of our elections. <laughs> and and, and I've, I've done this the whole time with a legislature that's about 60% Republican. So we have to show that we can get things done. I've also taken on what I think is the biggest threat to all of us, and this is really the corrupting influence of money in our overall system. So I think I bring things geographically different. I'm the only governor left in this Hunger Games. Right. Um, <laughs> generationally different. And, uh, you know, being off the coasts, with all due respect, isn't a bad position to be outside of Washington, D.C. Let's, let's talk about the why, then. Why do you think it is that somebody could vote for you with those progressive policies and then turn around and also vote for Donald Trump. It seems like a paradox. Yeah, I mean, for one thing, I mean, Montana is the geographic size of Japan, right? It's the fourth largest state in the country. I don't have the luxury of just going out and saying, where are those Democrats? I'm going to talk to them. Right. I actually have to engage all across that state. I show up, I listen, try to figure out what's happening. And I really do focus on getting things done. I think one of the challenges, like when you look at 60% of people in this country haven't had a pay increase in real terms in 40 years, right? I was growing up in the early 80s. 90% of 30-year-olds back then were doing better than their parents were at age 30. Today, it's only half. So there's a whole lot of folks that say, this economy's not working for us. Democrats often seem a little bit elitist and not even showing up and listening to some of the challenges. So I think that folks that voted for me, they disagreed with a whole lot of things maybe that I stood for. Right. But they also knew that I gave a damn about their life and I do everything possible to try to make their life better. Do you think that's the big rift in the Democratic Party right now is this idea that they don't have to listen or there's an elitist view? Is, is, is that what might be hurting the Democratic Party when it comes to those swing votes? Well, I think that there is a challenge. Yeah, back a long time ago, this guy named Mo Udall, he ran for president. He goes, when Democrats organize a firing squad, we usually do it in a circle, right? We're really good at kind of shooting at one another. Right. But I do think, like, look, I actually went to law school here in New York. I went to Columbia Law School. Ended up having to pay off $175,000 of debt in today's terms. It impacted what I could do along the way. So, we, yeah, we have to make sure the college is affordable. We got to make sure everybody has a path. But when 68% of Americans don't even have a two-year college degree, mm -hmm. have no degree, and all we're talking about is those folks that went to college, sometimes I think that there is a disconnect where folks are saying, what are you going to do to help my life get better? And then they look to Washington, D.C., right? And it's not worrying about them. When you look at it, that whoever cleans up tonight, this place, paid more in taxes than 60 Fortune 500 companies. Wow. Folks are just saying, it's not working. And But let's not kid ourselves. Like Donald Trump said he'd have your back. He has not. He's helped out stock buybacks. Or he said, look, we'll drain the swamp. It's swampier today than it ever was. <laughs> so you... You know, you, you have a grasp of these ideas. You, you understand the legislative side of fixing the problems. But you've specifically said you don't want to run as a senator. Yeah. You know, people have said, OK, forget the presidential race. Why not help the Democrats win, you know, the Senate race? That's going to make a bigger change. But you've said, I want to be an executive. What do you think the big difference is between just being a politician and being in a position like governor or being a president or a mayor or something of a, you know, that's more executive in its decision making? Yeah, I, I mean, I actually have to get shit done, right? I can't just... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, we shouldn't say that on no, a cable no, no, television. No, 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 that's just... Uh, you don't expect to hear that. Uh, I mean, me... <laughs> meaning that, like, I can't go out and say, well, here's my plan and it's just a press release. I can't just give speeches. I see people when they're struggling with health care. When I bring my son to a grocery store, somebody brings up an issue. 
I can't, it can't just be about even the partisan food fight. You have to meaningfully impact people's lives. And even as governor like Montana, when you look at everything from, boy, I'm commander in chief of National Guard. I've sent people on their fourth and fifth deployment overseas. Or when you look at college affordability, well, I froze college tuition. We have the fourth lowest tuition fees in the nation. We want to make sure it's affordable. So as an executive, you have to deal with all these issues that mm -hmm. come through your desk every single day. And I think I do bring a different perspective. Other than a perspective, though, on a policy side, what would you say is the one thing that separates you from all other 20 Democrats running, 37 or running many, for president? Right? Yeah. Because they, they, everyone has progressive ideas. You know, people want to lower college tuition. People are saying we've got to get money out of politics. There are a few ideas, but what do you think is the one thing where you go, like, Steve Bullock, this is the one thing I come with beyond perspective, yep. policy-wise, yeah. that'll change America? Yeah, and I think part of it is that I've not just talked about it, I've done it, right? When you look at dark money in our elections, we passed one of the most progressive laws in the country with a two-thirds Republican legislature that says, look, even if you call yourself Americans for America for America or whatever it is, mm -hmm. if you're going to spend in our elections, you have to disclose every dollar you're spending in the last 30 days. Never forget when I was run for re-election in 2016, about Oh, 92 days out, the Koch brothers, Americans for Prosperity, mailed every household in Montana. They even mailed the governor's residence. And my three kids are looking at this and saying, are you really that much of a creep, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> but then it stopped, right? It stopped 90 days out, and elections actually became about the candidates and people. And if we can stop That's there, we can stop them everywhere. Because if you look at the issues that we're facing right now, and a lot of them that are talking about uh, right. in this Democratic primary, from climate change to gun safety to income inequality to the fact that Costco can negotiate prescription drugs, but it's illegal for the federal government to negotiate prices, all of those things, in part, goes back to corrupting influence and money in our system. If we're going to fix that, then we can also fix all these other things. Take the money out. Yeah. <laughs> fix the system. <laughs> on, on guns, yeah. you've had a progressive view that some felt wasn't progressive enough. And then over time, your, your, you know, your views evolved. You, you, you weren't a fan of universal background yeah. checks. And then after Parkland, you came and you said, listen, I think we need to do more to fight, you know, guns getting into the wrong people's hands. Yeah. Some say, oh, that's not progressive enough. But how do you think the conversation in and around guns needs to be handled, especially as someone coming from Montana? Yeah, and I'm a gun owner, right? I hunt. 40% of households in America have a firearm in them. Never forget, I'm sitting in my office after it was the Vegas shooting. And we were asked to lower the flags. And I'm like, I don't even know what to write in this proclamation. And a coworker, a young staffer goes, oh, we now have a template for mass shootings. I've lowered them nine times since then, seven times since Parkland. I think if we could ever actually look at this as a public health issue, not as a political issue. Public health issue would say universal background checks. Look, the vast majority of Republicans, the vast majority of NRA members think that we should have universal background checks. Red flag laws, safe storage, Dix and Walmart no longer even sell assault weapons. There's no reason, you know, they're not used for hunting. They're not used for self-defense. We shouldn't do that as well. But I think when I was growing up, I mean, the NRA was, it was a gun safety. It was a hunting and a shooting organization. Mm -hmm. I'll give you 30 million reasons why we're not making a bit of progress. That's $30 million that they spent getting Trump elected. And we're at this point where, look, he said it right after Parkland. He said, universal background checks. We ought to do it. He talked to the head of NRA. Immediately walked backwards. After the El Paso and Dayton shootings, the same thing happened as well. So I think that the way that we do make progress on this, first of all, figure out who's funding, like are the Russians or who the, who the heck's funding the NRA. But more than that, recognizing that the commonality, I've never met a gun owner that isn't worried about saying, I sure hope my kid, when he has to go through those active shooter drills at school, I sure hope my kid um, never gets involved in something like that. If mm -hmm. we could ever make it even gun owners and gun owners alike saying, we've got to change what's happening here, and we could actually do it, we don't have to rely on just Washington, D.C. along the way. Pretty impressive plans. You seem like a focused man. Yeah. Good luck in the rest of the race. Thanks for having me. I hope we see you at the next debate after this debate. <laughs> Governor Steve Bullock, everybody.